We have covered quite a bit of ground over the past few weeks. And last week we looked at uh, <coughs> Adam and Eve and them eating and taking of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. So we're going to take up where we left off. We're going to be in Genesis chapter 3 this morning. We're going to take up where we left off. We're willing last week after Adam and Eve uh, partook of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And look at the, the fall out of that. We, we call this the fall of man. And we're also going to look at the promise. I told you last week, we'll be looking at the promise that God gave to overcome what he would do to overcome consequences of sin that man fell into. Let's go ahead and look now in Genesis chapter 3. Let's look in verse 6. And when, the woman, and when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was pleasant to the eyes and a tree to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof and did eat and gave also unto her husband with her and he did eat. And the eyes of them both were open, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. We looked at that last week, didn't we? Uh, you know, their eyes were open just like the devil said they would be. But now they didn't like what they saw, you know. Uh, we looked at the fact that now they had the knowledge of good and evil, that, um, you know, before they could only imagine their bodies to be used in a good way. But now they can see them in an evil way. And thus the, the beginning of all perversions, corruptions, you know. Think of money, for example. Uh, you know, when we first came in here, Shirley gave me some money from someone who had to work today so I could put an offering plate for her. And that money, God willing, will be put to good use here. But it could also be put to bad use too. You can bribe people with money. You can solicit uh, bad things with money. Uh, you know, you can hire somebody to kill somebody with money. All of that, that again, is the, based from the knowledge of good and evil, that we can pervert, corrupt, break anything now because we have that imagination to do so, which God had originally protected us from until the aid of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. <laughs> But now I want you to look at what was the first reaction they had. We just read there, what was the first thing they did when they ate of that tree and realized they were naked? Made they coverings. Said. They made themselves aprons, made coverings. Uh, that is the first instinct of man, is to try to cover up, to try to... Uh, fix, hide, whatever, uh, what he or she has done wrong. That is the first reaction of man when it comes to sin. Okay, And let's go ahead and look now uh, at verse 8. And they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife did what? They hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God amongst the trees of the garden. Man had never had to hide from God before. We looked at last week. And this is one of the problems of sin. That man's been hiding from God ever since. I used to have a preacher that would say that a lot of people, when they came to church and got baptized, after that the FBI couldn't find them. You know, <laughs> and, uh, boy, they'd go off and run off somewhere. They didn't want to come back to church again. And, uh, but man's been hiding from God ever since. God's been having to come and seek and find man and, and uh, make that overt action that to, to reach out and try to bring man back to where he's supposed to be. That was my experience in my life. Uh, we have a tendency to stray. The Bible says all we like sheep have gone astray. We've turned everyone to his own way. And... Uh, and like a good shepherd, God has to go seek man and try to bring him back where he's supposed to be. And that's exactly what we see now. They hear the Lord God, I'm sorry, in verse 8, they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. 
Adam and his wife hid himself, themselves from the presence of the Lord God amongst the trees of the garden. And the Lord God called unto Adam and said unto him, Where art thou? And he said, I heard thy voice in the garden, and I was afraid, because I was naked, and I hid myself. Now we have someone afraid of God, hiding from God. That's the result of sin. Didn't it all work out like the serpent had promised? <laughs> Just didn't happen that way. It never does. Sin always promises you more than what it can deliver. <laughs> uh, verse 11, and he said, Who told thee that thou wast naked? In other words, how did you acquire this knowledge? Now, God, remember, when we first began, we learned one of the attributes about God was that God was omniscient. Can anyone tell me what omniscient means? We looked at that like in one of the, I think it's the second lesson we had. I know it's been a while. I'll give you a quick rundown, maybe you'll remember. He's, number one, omnipotent, means he's all-powerful. He's omnipresent, means he's everywhere at the same time. And then he's omniscient, which means he knows all things. Okay, he knows all things. He knows what we think in our heart. The Bible says the dark and the light are both alike to him. You can't hide from him. Uh, he, he knows every everything that comes into our mind, and he knew where Adam and Eve were, but he's entering into this dialogue with them, sort of like a prosecutor who knows the defendant's guilty, will still cross-examine the defendant if he takes the stand, see, and trying to, what, bring the truth up out of that guilty person. And uh, so that's what God is doing here. Adam, where are you? Where are you? You know, that's the question every one of us need to ask ourselves. Where are we right now in our relationship with God? Are we hiding from God? Are we separated from God? Or are we one with God? You know, have we been born again? And we'll get into that later. But uh, where are we in relation to God? That's a question every one of us need to know and to ask ourselves. So then he says again in verse 11, Who told thee that thou wast naked? How did you acquire this knowledge? Hast thou eaten of the tree whereof I commanded thee that thou shouldest not eat? And the man said, Watch this now. The woman whom thou gavest to be with me, she gave me of the tree and I did eat. What does that look like Adam's doing? He blamed somebody else. Who did he blame? The woman. Who else did he blame? You, God. Yeah, you God. both of them, didn't he? And not me. He didn't say, and he answered like a typical liberal. You ever watch the liberal politicians? You try to ask them a straightforward question, they just dance around the whole thing. It's like he never even got an answer out of them. And that's the way he's doing here. And this is the, you know, spin didn't start in Washington, D.C. It started right here in the Garden of Eden. That's what sin does. Sin does not allow us to be able to directly take accountability for our actions. But you have to if you're going to make things right. He said, did you eat of the tree? Did you eat of the tree that I command you not to eat? He didn't say, oh, God, forgive me. Yes, Lord, I did. How, should I, how could I have done such an awful thing? He said, the woman, that's how it all started off, the woman who you gave, who you gave to be with me, she gave it to me and I ate. You know, I mean, it's the, the woman gave it to me and you gave the woman to me. And then I ate. But really, whose fault was it? His. His. Yeah, I mean, the woman could have eaten of it, sure. That didn't mean he had to, you know. Just like the old folks used to tell the kids, you know, well, Everybody's doing it. Well, if everyone jumps off a cliff, you're going to jump off too, you know. <laughs> and, uh, you know, you know, he didn't have to do that. We are all individually accountable. But now let's go ahead and see what God does. He's now, but, but, but first of all, watch where he begun. He begun at the man, right? Because he put man in charge. He gave man authority. But with authority always comes what? Responsibility. Period. You can't say, I'm in charge, and you're in trouble. If you're in charge, then you're accountable. 
Okay, authority and responsibility go hand in hand. But now, it does not negate the woman's choice. She also sinned, didn't she? She also disobeyed, so now he's going to go to the woman. Verse 13, the Lord God said unto the woman, What is this that thou hast done? Now look what the woman did. The woman and the woman said, The serpent begot me, and I did eat. So it just keeps passing the buck, passing the buck, passing the buck. Okay? So now what does God do? Well, he's going to hold the serpent accountable too. Verse 14, And the Lord God said unto the serpent, Because thou hast done this, thou art cursed, watch this now, above all cattle and above every beast of the field. Now go back to chapter 3, verse 1, and we're going to remember what we looked at last Sunday. Okay, Verse 1, Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. It meant the serpent was more cunning, more wise, had more intellect. It was uh, probably the most closest thing, the, the closest compatibility to man, much more even than the apes and gorillas like we talked about last week. So the serpent that was higher than the beast of the field is now going to be cursed above them, is going to be placed lower than all of them. Okay, so now let's see what happens. Verse 14, the Lord God said unto the serpent, Because thou hast done this, thou art cursed above all cattle and above every beast of the field. Upon thy belly shalt thou go, and dust shalt thou eat all the days of thy life. Okay, so now the serpent is cursed. Now the serpent is no longer standing upright and talking, uh, but now the serpent is crawling on its belly in a very loathsome state, now hated by every man except those who have an inordinate affection for reptiles. <laughs> I used to look at the crocodile hunter and think, man, he is crazy. And then when he died, I thought, yep, he is crazy. You know, I mean, they're, they're animals, and they need to be kept in their place. I respect all of God's creatures, and I thank God for them, and I love puppy dogs and kitty cats and all that. But uh, I tell you what, a snake comes in my backyard. I do what Adam should have done when the serpent came into his garden. I go out and get a hoe, you know. <laughs> and had they took a hoe to it, things would have been a whole lot better. But anyway, let's go ahead and look here. Uh, and, uh, and I want you to see something now, though, in verse 15. Verse 15 is a very, very important part of Scripture. And you're going to learn two things here. Number one, you're going to learn what we call in theology a double reference. A double reference. It's all through the Bible. It begins right here. This is the first time you'll ever see that, that, I, can, that I can see a double reference in Scripture. A double reference means that God speaks directly to the immediate and present. And while he's speaking directly to the immediate and the present, he's speaking indirectly to the not-so-immediate and the far-off future. The, 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 all right? The distant future. Does that, that make sense to everybody? Now, I'm going to give you an example. So you, you, you're going to see right here what I'm talking about. <clears throat> there is the immediate and the present. That's the serpent that was more cunning than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he's going to curse that serpent and make that serpent crawl on its belly for having yielded itself to the devil. The devil is the not so immediate and the indirect. The devil, the one who was Lucifer, who became Satan and rebelled in heaven, he now enters into this physical serpent, and now he utilizes that serpent to tempt our first parents, Adam and Eve. Okay, And so now he's talking to the serpent in verse 14. In verse 15, he's talking through the serpent to the devil. Okay? Um, there's one instance in the New Testament where we see God doing the exact same thing. The Apostle Peter, uh, 
went to Jesus and said, Lord, you know, you don't need to you don't need to do this and that and the other and trying to get Jesus to do something he shouldn't do, or rather keep him from doing something he should have done. And Jesus looked at the apostle Peter and said, Get thee behind me, Satan. Now, was Peter safe? No. But Peter's the one that said that to Jesus. But Jesus knew, being God himself, and we'll get into that when we get into the New Testament, Jesus knew that it was Satan that utilized Peter to try to tempt him to do wrong. So he addressed Peter, but he said Satan. That's exactly what we're seeing here with this servant. It's a double reference. Okay, This is a prophetical double reference. In other words, he's not just double referencing. He's not just speaking to one and through one, as Jesus did. He was speaking to Peter, and he was speaking through Peter to Satan at the same time. But this is a prophetical double reference. It means he's speaking to someone, yet through someone to somebody more indirect. But he's also speaking of something that's prophetic, something that's going to happen in the close near future in the far off distant future at the same time a double reference one of the reasons that we have double references in the bible is that when he says something in the immediate and present and it takes place then you know then what what he said about the not so immediate and the distant future it also will take place as well that's how that works does that Okay, everyone understand that? Okay. Okay. Doug? I'm good. You'll, all right, you, you'll, you'll see. All right, here we go. So in verse 14, the immediate and present, you're cursed with all cattle, you're going to crawl on your belly. Okay, now we see the serpents doing that today, right? Okay. But verse 15, watch this. This is the double reference right here. This is the indirect and the, the far off future. And I will put enmity. What's enmity? Enmity is, well, look at that word enmity. Does that look like another word? What kind of word does that look like? Maybe? What else do that kind of remind us of? How about the word enemy? That's what I was thinking. Okay, well, you was right on target. You just didn't want to say it. That's right. But you was right on target. Enemy. Yeah, when he says, I will put enmity, he says, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put animosity, I'm going to put, uh, I'm going to make enemies between you and someone else, okay? So let's see what he says. I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. It, the woman's seed, shall bruise thy head, the serpent's head, and thou, the serpent, shall bruise his heel. Anyone's translation say anything different? He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. Okay. They say anything else. Is that singular or plural? Sounds kind of singular. It is singular. It is singular. <clears throat> he didn't say you'll bruise their heel. See? You'll bruise his heel. Not her heel. Not their heel. Not our heel. His heel. Singular. One man. He's talking about here. This is, I, I, I get a chill when I'm thinking about it. Just watch that. I will put enmity. Number one, between you and the woman. Okay? Enmity. I'm going to make enemies out of you. So far, what's happened with a woman? Was she in enmity with the serpent, or was she in league with the serpent? She was in league. She was in league with the serpent. God said, I'm going to fix that. I'm going to change that. 
I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between her seed, what is that? That's offspring. Her offspring and your offspring. You also will have an offspring. From this point forward, man is going to begin to split into two divisions. Same way today. You will have those who are the children of God and those who are the children of the devil. Or you could say the godly line of people and the ungodly line of people. That's what he's gonna that's what he's gonna create. I will put enmity between your seed I'm sorry, and her seed. And then he says this. It, her seed, shall bruise your head. Your head. So the serpent's head will be bruised. <coughs> And in so doing, the serpent will bruise the heel of the woman's seed. You shall bruise his, not there. This is singular. In other words, someone in the seed, the descendancy of the woman, there would be one man who descended from the godly line who would bruise the head of the serpent. That's a metaphor. It's a metaphor. He would bruise the head. At this point in time, I told you all last week, what the devil was trying to do was to recreate on earth the rebellion that he created in heaven. So he could gain dominion. God had given man dominion. Remember, he said, let us create man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion. The Bible says, know ye not that to whom you yield yourselves servants to obey, his servants you are to whom you obey. So, if the devil could get mankind to yield to his temptation, now the devil, through sin, would now gain dominion on earth. That's exactly what just happened. He is now the head and ruler of the world, the devil. You know the Bible calls, you know what the, Jesus called the devil? The God of this world. You know what The God of this world. The prince of the power of the air, the rulers of the darkness, and, uh, but uh, uh, the, 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 king, the king of the darkness. <coughs> yeah, there's, that's what he is. He's the God of this world. Okay. Not the God of this world in the sense that he's God, but the God of this world in this, uh, this, this fallen world system. That makes sense? Okay. God owns everything. It's God's world. It's God's earth. It's God's people. But the people have yielded to this rebellion that he begun, just as the angels yielded to his rebellion in heaven, and now they, the, he got man to yield to his rebellion here on earth. He is now the God of this world system. Man, we're going to look at here in a moment, will be born into this world system and born into that rebellion, born into sin. But there would be someone in this godly line who would descend, who would come and crush the head of the serpent, the devil. That means he would defeat him, okay, as one king would come and crush another king and destroy his empire. But in so doing, the seed that crushed the serpent's head, the serpent would bruise his heel. It's not talking about a snake bite on the back of somebody's foot. It's a metaphor. And uh, it's very, very important. Uh, that's why when you get to the New Testament, the Apostle Paul says to the Christian people he's writing to, and the God of peace shall bruise Satan under your heel shortly. 
It's just amazing. If you don't understand it here in the Old Testament, you won't get, you, you'll just fly right over your head in the New Testament. You've got to get this stuff down. It's absolutely incredible. So this is what we have right now. There would be somebody from the woman's descendancy, from the godly line, Eve would begin begetting people. Yeah, there would be somebody from this godly line that's represented by the woman here. That doesn't mean every child she has is going to be a good person. But it again, you just have to catch it now, and as we go and go and go, it will be more and more vivid as we go. It's that piece of the puzzle, and not every image is on that piece. He just lays those pieces out as you go throughout the Bible. But just understand, this is the piece we're looking at now. Someone would descend from her line. That person would overcome the devil and thus be able to rescue man, save man, deliver man from the consequences of the sin that the serpent had caused, the devil had caused. And in so doing, his heel would be bruised. Okay? It would not, it would come at a price. That makes sense? So, the devil used a woman to bring sin to man. And now God says, I'm going to use that same woman to bring a Savior to man. You see how that works? That's how God works. Nobody can fight against God and win. And so God says, I'm going to take that same woman that you use to bring sin to man, and I'm going to take her, and through here I'm going to bring a Savior to man, and I'm going to destroy you through that Savior. Isn't that good? Boy, that's what he's saying. Woo! All right. Now, let's go ahead and look here. Verse 16. Unto the woman, he said, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow and thy conception, and sorrow thou shalt bring forth children. Thy desire shall be thy husband, and he shall rule over thee. So now here's the woman. Here's the, uh, the uh, great... Uh, uh, highlight the great thing the woman's known for uh, as far as the curse goes her what she brought on her or brought on other women not that she was going to bear children she's going to bear children in the beginning but that in that childbearing you see that word sorrow mm -hmm. childbearing was never meant to have sorrow in it never it was all we were never meant to know sorrow but now that we know good and evil, we do. So, uh, but in sorrow, thou shalt bring forth children. She was always supposed to bring forth children, but it was never supposed to be in sorrow. Never supposed to be the, the, the labor and intensity that it is today. Okay? Thy desire shall be thy husband, and he shall rule over thee. Man was always supposed to rule over the woman. He made man first. He made woman to be his helper. What's the difference now? The difference is it'll be in sorrow. Now there's going to be conflict. Now there's going to be struggle. You know, and one don't always see that today. Still struggle today. Still struggle today. Um, over gender and everything. And it's just always, it's conflict. Why is that there? Cause of sin. Cause of sin. Verse 17. Now watch what he's doing. He's progressively moving back. Adam passed it off to the woman. God moved to the woman. Woman passes off to the serpent. God moved to the serpent. And what does God do? He starts with the serpent. He comes back to the woman. He's opening. We go right back where he started. <laughs> because responsibility is responsibility is responsibility. Yeah, the woman gave that to Adam. But it was man's fault that we fell into sin. It was man's fault. Okay? Let's go ahead and look here now. And unto Adam he said, Because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife. Look at that. Hearken to the voice of thy wife. What does that say anyway? You aren't listening to me, God's saying. You aren't listening to me. There's lots of influences in this world. But we work from the top down, right? God down. Because thou hast hearkened to the voice of thy wife, and hast eaten of the tree of which I commanded thee, saying, Thou shalt not eat of it. Here it is now. You might want to underscore this in your Bible. Cursed is the ground. Do you see that? Cursed is the ground for thy sake. 
There's that word again, in sorrow. See it? In sorrow shalt thou eat of it all the days of thy life. Thorns and thistles shall it bring forth to thee, and thou shalt eat the herb of the field. And the sweat of thy face shalt thou eat bread, till thou return unto the ground. For out of it wast thou taken, for dust thou art, and unto dust shalt thou return. So you see the same thing with Adam. The sweat of your face you'll eat bread, right? We were all, man was always meant to work. You remember what God did when God first created Adam? He put them in, him in the garden to walk, to dress it, to keep it. Man was always meant to work. The problem, the problem is work was never meant to have sorrow in it, <laughs> just like the childbirth. It was never meant to have sorrow in it. It was meant to, you know, and, and, and you know, Doug was talking about him working on his truck the other day. Work does give us some level of satisfaction, doesn't it? Sure. No matter what we are, what gender we are, work gives us some level of satisfaction. If we feel we're accomplishing something, it especially gives satisfaction to a man. Man loves to conquer, to build, to accomplish. That is put into us by God. Unfortunately, now because of sin, sorrow, toil, and cumbersomeness that comes with that labor. And uh, it's the very reason I keep saying when I get home at the end of the day, boy, I'm ready to retire. <laughs> okay. So anyway, uh, that's what we have right here. But what did God curse? What did he curse? The ground. He cursed the ground, Doug. That's right. What does that affect? Our groceries, food. Everything. Everything. What are we made out of? The ground. I, I mean, you don't have to be a rock scientist for that. Put you back in the dirt and put a hole over you. I mean, cover you up in a hole. Give you a few years and you just start turning right back in the dirt again. And that's what we come from. He said, you're going to do this until you return unto the ground. For out of it you were taken, for dust you are, and unto dust you shall return. That's what happens. When God cursed that ground, what comes from the ground? Everything. Everything comes from the ground. Germs come from the ground. Bacteria come from the ground. Worms, serpents, dogs, kitty cats, people, cows, vegetables. We said out some lettuce and tomatoes yesterday. It comes from the ground. Problem is that ground's cursed. And when God cursed that ground, Every one of us come from that ground God cursed. So where the ground is cursed, the world is cursed. Because the world is cursed, the world has to die. What we eat, who we are, it's all cursed. It affected everything. You notice if you'll look there in verse 18, thorns also and thistles shall it bring forth to thee. Thorns and thistles. For this, you can pick a rose. Never go, ouch, you know, uh, little, uh, the whole world's curse. Uh, the, you, know, you didn't have to worry about mosquitoes biting in and everything else. Everything now is adverse to man. You see, it's, it's thrown out of whack. And the Bible says in the New Testament, we're waiting for God to take this curse away from the world and make it like it was again. That's really what we're looking forward to. That's part of the serpent being having his head crushed by this coming Savior. He's going to remove the curse from the ground, thus remove the curse from man, and uh, eliminate the consequences of sin. Okay? That's what's, that's what's going to happen, at least for certain people, right, for the godly line. And we're going to look at that as we continue to go through. So now man uh, has... Uh, has fallen into sin. And now man has this curse. So let's go ahead and look here now. The last we left, left off, God is talking to man. Man and his wife uh, had fig leaves that they sewed together. And we're going to see something now. Look in verse 21. This is very, very important. Verse 21. And unto Adam also and to his wife did the Lord God make coats of skins. Look here now and clothe them. Clothing, very, very important. God did not accept the clothing that they wove for themselves. Y'all see that? He did not accept it. Did not accept it. 
that is man's, again, his first response to sin. I'm going to cover up. I'm going to weave some way to put this on me and God will never notice. It doesn't work that way. Man, when man realizes he's a sinner, or she's a sinner, our first response is to say, well, I'll start doing better. I'll start going to church. I'll start praying. I'll start doing this, or I'll start meditating, or whatever man does, whatever part of the world he's in. It's because we're incurably religious. I want to start doing something to make me feel better about me. But when it gets down to it, you stand before God, and God looks at you. He sees a naked person with some of his own self-woven works trying to cover himself, and it's just not going to be accepted. Learn this now. Learn this now. God is perfect. Therefore, everything God accepts must be perfect. Learn that now. We're going to look more and more as we go. God is perfect. So everything he accepts has to be perfect. Adam and Eve are not perfect right now. They are wearing a robe of shame that does what? Does not forgive them, does not pardon them, does not excuse them. But every time God looks at those fig leaves, what does he see? A reminder of their sin that brought that about in the first place. They cannot stand before him in innocence or in righteousness. They cannot. Neither can we stand before God that way. So what did God do? God made coats of skins and clothing. Now I want you to notice that this is right on the heels of the promise that he made about sending a Savior. When God made coats of skins and clothed them, what did God have to do to make those coats of skins? Kill the animals. He had to kill an animal. Now God told Adam and Eve, I'll finish this sentence for me. But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, thou shalt not eat of it. For the day thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. Adam and Eve had to die now. They had to die. Right? But watch what God does. If God killed Adam and Eve that day, we wouldn't even be standing, sitting here right now, right? The death sentence that God gave Adam and Eve had to be carried out. God's holy. He's righteous. You break his law. Penalty for sin is death. Watch what God does. He carries out that death sentence on Adam and Eve. He carries it out on innocent substitutes. See that? That makes sense? He takes the death sentence. Instead of coming here and slaying Adam and Eve, he comes over here and he slays innocent animal substitutes in their place. Takes their skin off of them. The animals are innocent. Takes their skin off of them. It comes over here and clothes. Didn't say he handed them the coats and they put them on. It says he clothed them. And he clothes Adam and Eve. And now, when God looks at Adam, what does he see? He can't look at Adam anymore without seeing the skin of that innocent animal. Right? He can't look at Adam anymore without seeing the death of an innocent substitute in Adam's place. You see that? I can't look at Doug without noticing he's got a blue collared shirt on. Right? Gray. My wife would laugh at that. She's always getting on him in my colors. But when God looked at Adam and Eve now, he could not look at them without seeing them clothed 
in the innocence of their substitute. He could not look at them without seeing the death of an innocent substitute in their place. And because of them being robed in that substitutionary sacrifice, God could look at them and see innocence when they weren't innocent. They were only innocent through the substitute. He could look at them and see his sentence carried out, judgment being carried out, because it had been carried out in the substitute, clothed with them. That's exactly, I already erased it, that's exactly what the seed of the woman would be for man. And God was showing man right here how man could stand before him as innocent, though he was not innocent. If you could boil the gospel, if you could boil salvation, church, Christianity, down to one word, this word right here. That's it. Let that just sink into your mind today. Did this take care of man's sin problem? No. Animals did not sin. Man sinned. You have to think of these animals that God just slew like a credit card like a credit card, okay? I've got a credit card right here. It's a MasterCard. Follow that MasterCard, it's got my name on it. Richard Fulton. Every time I swipe that card, it represents an agreement that I've made, or that the cardholders made, excuse me, the, the, the bank has made with me. That I would one day pay the bill when that bill came due. My name is on this piece of plastic. That doesn't mean I am that piece of plastic, right? It just means that piece of plastic has my name on it and it represents me that I will pay it when it comes due. But the plastic can't pay for it, right? Ultimately, Richard gets the bill, and Richard pulls down the cold cash for it at the end of the month. These animals, these innocent substitutes, had the name of the substitute on there, just like a credit card. They did not pay for the sin of Adam and Eve. They simply represented the promise that God just made that one day, a seed of the woman would come and pay the bill when it came due. Does that make sense? And we're going to see this get clearer and clearer and clearer through the scripture as we go. So they're still, they're still sinners. And their sins must be paid for. Now they are, through death, cut off from God. If you'll look real quick, and we're going to stop. Look in verse 22. And the Lord God said, Behold, the man has become as one of us to know good and evil. And now, lest he put forth his hand and take also the tree of life and eat and live forever. Therefore the Lord God sent him forth from the Garden of Eden to till the ground from whence he was taken. So he drove out the man and he placed at the east of the Garden of Eden cherubims. And a flaming sword was turned every way to keep the way of the tree of life. Man was now driven out of the garden, driven out of his home because of sin. Just as the devil was cast out of heaven, so now Adam and Eve are cast out of Eden. He can no longer take the tree of life and eat and live forever. He's now forced to live in this separation from God uh, and to eventually turn to dust of the ground. So now man is just like this branch that my son cut off of a shrub outside of the church. It's green. It's beautiful. Uh, if it was a different time of year, it would have red uh, flowers on it, red blossoms, pinkish red doesn't look dead, but it is dead. Why? 
because it has been separated from its source of life. That's how man is. That's how the human race is. We're born separated from our source of life. So eventually, just like this plant that's now beautiful and green, we shrivel up, we wrinkle up, and the effects of our separation ultimately uh, come full circle, and then we turn back into dust, just like this will. Okay, and I'm going to leave this. I'll tape it up later, I suppose. But I'm going to leave this here for the duration of our uh, of our class. Okay, and uh, of the rest of our lessons here, we'll keep our eye on that. So, any questions? What we went over today? All right, good stuff.